So welcome to this webinar. Uh, I'll be interrupting because I'm the only manager of this show and somebody will be admitted in the, in the meanwhile while I talk. So apologies for that as well. So today's webinar is about the uh, divide, digital divide that we face. And it's about the book launch by Madame Leslie Ware. And I thank Madam for accepting this honor to me and honor to the community globally. So the agenda is we'll have the introduction of mine for a few minutes, please bear with me. I may be boring, uh, but then the book launch will be the main item for the first part of the session. And then the conversation about the digital divide which we are facing everywhere, not just in some places. So the book is a contribution of not mine. It starts with my library school in Mysore University, India, and Professor Shalini is here to honor me and honor the community of librarianship, archives, museums, and whatever is the information information world call. I call it infrastructure because technology is infrastructure. I would like to call it infrastructure and that is where I'm going to land. So thank you all the friends, supporters and honorable faculty, professors, librarians, archivists, museologists all over the world. My salutes to everyone. And my exploration in lamb structure, that's what I call lamb sector, is being global. I started from my hometown in India with vis visits to galleries and museums. And that went on to Library of Congress, to the national museums, national archives globally. One part of it has been a collective effort to combine information about South Asian librarianship in terms of collection, in terms of dissemination. And if you see the bottom of the screen, I have the University of Texas at Austin, where I landed in my Fulbright program before I went to Rutgers and met my mentor, Professor Betty Tarok. So this visit at Texas was a part of the program in which I found Dr. Donald Davis, who co-authored with me for a book on library history. He is a champion and a master of library history of the world. And he helped me write and compile a book on Indian library history for first for the 5,000 years and then next for the specific 60 years period of the post independent India. A little more of my tour is on the other slide, which includes the British world, the Smithsonian Museum, and the Library of Congress visit that I had. More importantly, I carry small little anecdotes, as in, I saw one in Ellis Island in New York, and that's, that code is very popular, but that it disappears from this screen most of the time. The, the quote is, when I came to America, I was told that the streets are paved with gold. When I got there, I found these streets are not paved with gold, and I was told that they weren't paved at all, and third, I was to pave them. This is the story of an immigrant, and I just replicate the same story of building bridges wherever I can in terms of building not gold and not streets with gold, but building bridges in information sharing, information and knowledge sharing. Thank you. The book is about social justice and civic engineering, uh, sorry, civic engagement. Uh, I, I find social justice is interesting for me as an immigrant librarian, immigrant professional, and uh, immigrant who is who's, uh, trying, to, trying to put feet into the profession. So my, my narrative is not my, the book is not about my in, in, uh, findings and my stories, but it is all over about the libraries, archives, museums, and how social justice and civic engagement is being practiced. 
by the thought leaders and by the people who are at the managerial level and people who are actually at the ground level. All these contribute together. And I'm not in this book trying to dispute about anything. It's not a debate. It's not a controversial thesis about libraries, archive museums coming together as convergence or synchronizing or merging or collaborating. I'm not into those. I'm into the real practical scenarios of sharing information. So this book is about the reflection, social mission and civic responsibility. Shara had spoken about it, Ranganathan had spoken about it, so many others have spoken about it. And my, my finding is every 10 years, there is one book, one article that comes to remind us. And Muhammad is now another reminder for people who forget that we have our civic and social responsibility as part of the foundation of our professions. Um, the last line here says, what's so special about this book? And there's a good news about our sensitive system like leadership, trying to work of professionals, of academicians, of people from the community. And so it's a joint collaborative work of 22 chapters by 36 authors from six continents. Thank you, my authors, and thank you, my friends who collaborated for this particular book. A little glance at the case studies is good to see the inside picture of the book. And this is an example of slides. In the slide, you see a contribution, a chapter from Indonesia, a chapter from uh, India, a chapter from Canada, a chapter from Africa, a chapter from Hungary, and another on smart city technologies. I have put two small pictures because I believe in visualizing in the information rather than reading it the whole life. For example, here on the bottom, I have a picture of a museum in India on which I wrote an article about 20 years back. And now I have an opportunity by this good author who contributed a chapter for this book. And this chapter took me to the world catalog to see the catalogs of the catalogs of that museum. I found 60 libraries in the world have this library, has this museum's catalog. A catalog at that point of time was only a manuscript, but then later on it went on into a print format, into a shareable format, into a communicable format. So that is what is the museum catalog about in the world catalog. And that is what I understand is globalization where you can see collections from one part of the world being transmitted and disseminated through libraries, museums, and archives. And for me, I'm a student of all these fields. So I do not say I have a monopoly in libraries to share this information, or I have monopoly in museums to say only museums share it, or I'd say I can't say archives only share it. All information infrastructures organizations equally are equally are supportive and equally sharing this information. The second picture on this slide is the city of Toronto and Ontario's smart city project. This, this smart city project is focused, this article, this chapter is focused on civic engagement of how communities are being involved and engaged in building towards, in building a path towards the smart cities. So we go back to the previous slide and this is about the book and it's special offer by the publisher to say that you can have this special exclusive offer of 50% promotional discount for this book. And I would recommend, I would appreciate if you can pass on this information to librarians, to archivists, to museologists, so that they can look at the value of the book and see how it is helping dissemination of knowledge, dissemination of research and dissemination of ideas of all types of people writing and contributing to the world of information and knowledge. Uh, the next part here is the survey that I conducted in the process of writing the book. It was a global survey. And the results that I have here are a few samples from that survey. Uh, number one here is a sample of name of the museum. I asked my respondents to tell me if that name is, I was blunt. I asked them to say whether it is confusing or is it clear to them? Here I said, not really confusing, and they responded instead of getting, oh, sorry, I'm speaking about the other slide. Oh yeah, this is the museum uh, slide. 
And my question is whether the name name part is a digital bridge or it's a digital divide. I gave them six names of museums to tell me which is clear to them, rather confusing to them or unconfusing or uh, clear in terms of conveying the museum as a concept. So auditorium was the one which said 64% said it was not clear, it was unclear to them. And in ingenium is another name, 55% of them, the respondents said that it's not clear to them. Interestingly for me, Canadian National Exhibition, 77% of the people said it's clear. Google Arts and Culture, for my mind, it was innovative, but then 70% of the audience said it's clear to them that it is conveying the idea of a museum. So as a person working on control vocabulary, I looked at the thesaurus, I looked at the dictionaries available for helping me solve the terminology issues. So this is one part of the work that is still required to be done as a social metadata problem where people can get the real, real gist of what the names are, how they are communicable in different scenarios and different, in different uh, formats. The other slide is here about the digital readiness or digital preparedness. And I asked the respondents, how much do you think libraries are prepared for this, um, for this uh, digital uh, age that is coming with the COVID and the pandemic thing where we are totally dependent on digital thing. On the right side, you see the summary of the percentage which shows libraries are uh, getting ready, libraries are not really ready and libraries are into it. So into it is showing about the lower percentage rather than getting ready percentage. Getting ready is higher. And that is my good news to say that libraries, archives, museums are getting ready. They are not behind anywhere in the, on the earth. <coughs> Okay, let's come to what is social justice doing here in terms of empathy and equity. For me, I found the simplest definition of social justice is the golden rule of reciprocity. On the right side is the golden rules for 13 different faith groups. Uh, that is simply to say that golden rule is a universal global idea of understanding the other of reciprocating with the other, of treating the other as you would like to be treated by yourself. That is the definition of social justice in my book, in my idea. And the next is the so civic engagement. Civic engagement for me is involving everyone with openness and fairness. This I have taken from Inclusum, that's another museum. What I want to focus on is Empathy, equity, civic engagement is all part of the plan where it has to be with the whole person, not just inquiring about education, inquiring about parts and parcels, piecemeal, piecemeal solutions. Rather, it has to be the whole of person. And a chapter in this book has full focus on whole of person in libraries, archives, and museums, and how it can be further implemented if it is wherever there are gaps. I say it's not completely fully visible everywhere. So that kind of moment and the momentum has to be there for making it whole person librarianship, whole person museums, whole person uh, uh, archives. Coming to the question of empathy, equity and justice, there's a charter of compassion, which tells us what actually it means. It means responsibility, it means care for the thought leaders to think about it. And the next thing we talk about is the digital divide. Digital, digital divide has gone into different levels and rounds, as Ranganathan would call it, levels and rounds. So the first level of digital divide is a thought, a process of getting internet access to everyone. The World Economic Forum said it's not going to solve the problem with everyone because I found another quote which says, Water, water everywhere, but not an internet link. Internet link is, even if it is provided to Wi-Fi on the streets, it's for the haves. What about me who's a have not? I don't have a palm health computer. 
I don't have a app on my computer. So where, where am I with your, with your offer to say internet is on the street and internet is on the campus, internet is on, this, on the corner. So the second level of digital divide is about skills and type of use. For example, I'm a user of the museum. I'm a user of the archive. How would I know what kind of use would I be able to make it make out of it? So there's a literacy campaign, literacy program that is there, but it needs to be focused on digital divide. We are coming to that in one more second of what digital divide means. I'm going to the third, fourth, fifth level in this bullet number three, the talks of findability versus discoverability. Thanks to internet that started with one issue. Now it's there's the internet of things that's trying to help find and find, find discover with, with Wait. serendipity. That is what is called discoverability. And the book has few ideas to move towards discoverability, but this is not a book on internet of things. So we did not go into depth and details of internet of things. Coming to the digital divide, my idea is if you think of non-technological or invisible um, areas, then you can think of empathy and then you can think of equity, <clears throat> which are human concerns, not machine concerns primarily. So for example, where the challenge is, the, the challenge number one is marginalized. Marginalized could be people who are not able to reach, marginalized could be the people in the community who are isolated. The second one is the minoritized. Those people who are not considered as part of the mainstream are minoritized or treated as minoritized are not taken, taken into the planning or implementation process, whatever it means. The third is the underserved. And why would I say underserved? Because served is open, like libraries are open, museums are open, the archives are open. But what happens is this openness, for example, in the biggest library on the earth of the public nature, the membership is 40%. Which means 60% are underserved. More on that later or when we find time to discuss and debate on that. The fourth category is underprivileged, which means there is net, there is internet, but I don't have access to the tools that I need to access it. I don't have the hearing, vision, vision or kind of aids that I need to get to it. So across each of these challenges, I have suggested a bridge, which needs more detailed elaborate uh, discussion, but I've just highlighted it. For the marginalized, what comes is inclusion. For the minoritized, what comes is belongingness. For the underserved, what comes to the rescue is the fairness. Why would I say fairness in a fair world? Sorry, I'm discriminating there. But fairness for me is I should be equally keeping the programs usable, available, accessible, and empowering the users of all heights and size and things. But normally our programs are all one size fits all. So that is where is the question of fairness. That's a question of equity being considered as important thing. The last bullet is about the access, access for the people who are impaired. For example, I cannot see the fonts on the screen do I have flexibility to do it myself or I have to call the librarian, the like computer uh, techie, techie specialist or whatever. So these are the uh, bridges which can help us move further and clear it uh, as a path towards user friendliness, towards community engagement, civic engagement and social justice. By the way, we are reminded by one author Sanders that these issues are not casual. They are not just for entertainment. They are real human rights issues, which are to be considered for their replications and implications by our leaders. They are aware of it, I'm sure. I'm just a beginner. So I'm just putting it in my words to say that it's a human rights issue for people who are not considered in these categories, they should be, they should be considerate and, and empathetic towards. Anyway, first the good news that I mentioned in my initial stage, is about the system sensitive leadership, which is demonstrating that they are 
aware of need for empathy. They are aware of the need for e equity. They are aware of the needs of the have-nots. So this is one example of a compassionate museum, an empathy library. And there's a long list of these I have not included here for a shortage of time. The next more good news is how libraries, museums, archives, and places where there is information, they extend their information to the public to be visible and to their cultures, to their according to their religious or festival part. The next is the, the next slide is about the issues under consideration by system sensitive leadership, but it needs speed. There's a need for speed when it comes to male percentage. You can see 87% of the male percentage in a museum, 85% are white. And so this is where the considerations are there and it may take time for them to resolve it. On the, the next slide is the idea of research. The book has it in on page uh, 46. These are the five laws of Ranganathan which I have applied for the libraries, archives, museums on user engagement. The first is lamps are for use, which is accordingly originally called books are for use. And now I have turned it to say libraries, archives, museums are for use, not just show places. The second is they empower the users with equity. The third is the extension service, Ranganathan had highlighted that they need to go information with information to their doorsteps. This extension services is emphatically for information for living. It's not information for education. It's not just information for entertainment. It's information for living that is extended to the community wherever they live. The fourth bullet and the fourth research agenda is LAMPs save the time of the user. In the digital age, in the virtual age, this is more and more emphasized and more and more necessary to save the time. The next is LAMPs are living organism, which means that they are not there just for the time being. They don't simply sit and sit and dream in their land. They are living organisms helping people move into their domain as per the people's needs and choices. Here ends my presentation and any questions for me? Just a minute, if you have any questions, write down please on your um, thing if you have any, and we can try to answer those questions after the session. I think I crossed my time and took away Professor Leslie Weir's time. Sorry, madam, I'm running late. Professor Stephen Abraham will introduce Leslie Weir, Madam Leslie Weir, please, Stephen. Thank you, Mohammed. It's a great honor to speak to this uh, international uh, event uh, to give you our Canadian National Librarian and Archivist for the third largest national library on this earth. Uh, I'm proud to say Leslie is a colleague, but also a friend. Uh, and I think she's been a great leader on social justice and the sharing economy and the way things are. She became librarian and archivist of Canada in 2019. Prior to that, she was at the university librarian at the University of Ottawa, where I think of her fondly because my son did uh, his uh, PhD at the University of Ottawa. And Leslie was... Uh, a leader in providing personal librarians to every PhD student. And Zach had two, one in history and one in English so that he could accomplish his uh, dissertation. And that kind of initiative, that kind of caring, that kind of individual support is a hallmark of her career. Uh, she founded the School of Information Studies, Canada's newest uh, library school at the Faculty of Arts in the University of Ottawa and was a, a professor and is, is a professor there. Prior to her arrival at the university, she held uh, positions at the National Library of Canada and Statistics Canada Library and she has her master's in library science from McGill University and a Bachelor of Arts in Canadian history from Concordia University, which of course sets herself up well to have so many library and historical researchers on her team at Library and Archives Canada. 
She's been transformative in leading and guiding many moments within the Canadian Research and Knowledge Network and research libraries in Canada. Uh, she founded the Scholars Portal, a state-of-the-art research infrastructure for all Ontario universities, uh, one of the founding partners. And she served as chair of the Ontario Council of University Libraries, president of Canadiana.org, uh, which handles a lot of our digitation and her of heritage works for Canada, and uh, now holds over 60 million uh, mostly Canadian images. And she was president of the Canadian Re Association of Research Libraries and the Ontario Library Association. Her dedication and outstanding service have been awarded many, many, many times. But on a personal note, uh, sometimes we deify uh, leaders in our profession and make them all blue suit and shoulder pads and Leslie is one of the humans of earth. She can dance, she can karaoke. <clears throat> she has humor crafted like a fine dry wine. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our Canadian National Librarian and Archivist. You will love her. Go ahead, Leslie. Wow. Thank you for that incredible uh, introduction, Stephen. And and thank you so much, Mohammed, for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, I'm not sure that my words are gonna are, are gonna compete with with Stephen's introduction, um, but um, I, I will make every effort. Um, I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. And I acknowledge that they are the uh, caretakers of this land in the past, in the present, and will be in the future. I am really thrilled to be with you today to launch the incredible handbook of research on the role of libraries, archives, and museums in achieving civic engagement and social justice in smart cities. Thank you so much to Mohammed for inviting me to participate in this exciting international event. As Mohammed so eloquently expressed in his introduction, this handbook takes on the challenge of moving forward to break digital barriers by unboxing empathy and equity. These 22 stories will serve as inspiration for libraries, archives, and museums around the world, and I think will be a catalyst for change. We're experiencing a moment in human history. Many societies and their institutions are aspiring to be more inclusive and welcoming of all communities. And social engagement and so, uh, civic enga engagement and social justice are really cornerstones that tell us what the future could look like. Libraries, archives and museums, LAMS, and galleries as well are key participants in this movement. They are so well positioned in leveraging their community engagement and their talents as natural innovators. And partnerships related to social issues have such great potential for transformation and can and will have great impact. Many of these institutions in countries around the world have already shifted their focus from repositories of collections to community-led responsive institutions that focus on civic engagement and outreach within their communities. The pandemic has increased existing divides, but it's also demonstrated that collaboration, whether between LAMS or with other community partners is really critical during times of crisis in order for us to effectively serve our communities. It has also provided us with an opportunity to critically self-reflect on our current ways of working and to focus on a future of inclusion and diversity. In fact, um, the university forum that was put on collaboration with Libraries and Archives Canada's University Partners in Canada, which was held in June, 2021, was um, focused on memory institutions as equitable, diverse and inclusive places. Earlier in the spring, 
Libraries and Archives Canada hosted a glam think tank with five sessions bringing together 60 influencers from across Canada to look at what the influence of glam's post-pandemic might be or could be. And one of the overarching messages was that glams need to take a leading role in supporting Canadian society to be much more inclusive and reflective of all individuals and all communities. We have an incredible opportunity to underpin the actual change that we'll need to address history and lay out how we wanna do things differently in the future. And the stories in this book, the chapters that touch on literacy, digital literacy, critical thinking, addressing the digital divide, and um, countering fake news and the polarization of views in society are really critical to a civil society. And LAM institutions are taking on these challenges. We also need to change our institutions from within. And uh, for this reason, a collaborative spirit is really essential to achieve changes in attitudes and in practices. Although there's been a great deal of important work done over the years to encourage diversity and inclusion within memory institutions, there is so much more that we can do, especially as the pandemic has disproportionately affected certain groups um, within our communities. Having greater diversity in our profession will result in different voices and perspectives around the table. It will change the way we interact with our communities, how we function, what we acquire, what we exhibit, and how we ensure that our services and our collections reflect all the views and serve all the communities. And in the case of Canada, ensure that what resonates with Canadians um, will represent an inclusive approach that can be used in telling our history. Because in the end, the actions and decisions that we as LAM institutions take today is really going to shape the civil society of the future. The Handbook of Research on the Role of Libraries, Archives, and Museums in Achieving Civic Engagement and Social Justice in Smart Cities shines a light on the LAM's emerging roles. And I think will inspire professionals in libraries, archives, and museums around the world. So thank you once again for this opportunity to be with, your, with you today. Um, and like all of you, I'm really excited to hear from our panelists. So at this point, I'll turn things back to you, Mohammed. Thanks, Madam. And I thank you for releasing this book. It's a, it's a 500 page. I wouldn't call it a Bible. I would call it a textbook, a reference book, a resource book. So 500 pages will not be read by people, but they will read the chapters, they will read the sections, they will read the lessons learned in the process. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Stephen, Steve Abram, for introducing Madam. Steve Abram, I forgot to introduce you. He's a librarian and principal with Lighthouse Consulting, an executive director formerly of the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries. How I knew Stu is Steve is a, is a lesson for everyone to say, I keep knocking the doors. And like Ranganathan said, go with the help, go with these inquiries, go with questions to people. I went to Steve and asked him to give a lecture in my School of Library Science at Seneca College. And he said, why not? Yesterday I sent him an email and requested him to be the introducer. He said, why not? So this is what is empathy. This is what is equity. Steve doesn't know me. He never met me or oh, met me before the uh, lecture that he gave at Seneca College. But then otherwise, this is what is the information profession. I didn't knew Ranganathan. I know all his students, most of them. Professor Shalini is a student of the Ranganathan Circle. And I took information from there to say, books are for use, libraries are for use, now lamps are for use. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being with us and sharing this kind of important opportunity about digital divide and digital divide with empathy and equity. This brings me to the panel session. The panel is with seven panelists on the team uh, and they will be taking a little time to tell you about the empathy and equity experiences, exposure and the issues that are there. And 
uh, for me, I just need to tell you who they are. It's the moderator is Professor Shalini from Mysore in, in India. And uh, the other panelists, the panelists are six. That includes uh, Brendan Edwards from Queen's University, Laura Coleman, Laura Edith Coleman from Drexel University, Abigail Phillips from uh, Wisconsin, Madison, right? Uh, Anita Coleman from, uh, from the university, which I was affiliated with well. It's, uh, Sarla Utengi is from the public library domain, and Vanessa Irwin is from the profession, as well as she's from the diversity publication of the journal called Diversity and Inclusiveness. And I welcome all the panelists. And Professor Shalini, as a moderator, will take over this session now. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, good evening, good morning to one and all, depending on which part of the world you, that you are in. Uh, uh, thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Mohammed Tahir, my student. I'm proud to say that, you know, Mohammed Tahir was my student way back in the 70s. Uh, of course, that shows my age and his age too. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to be part of this international community of uh, scholars who are talking about and who are actually, of course, the release of the uh, wonderful book uh, edited by uh, Mahmoud Tahe, and which is one of the, I would say, the most uh, relevant and topical theme that uh, I would also call it as one of the ambitious uh, projects of uh, uh, Mahmoud Tahe, because it covers not only the convergence of the memory institutions, libraries, archives, and uh, museums, and of course, galleries too, as well as the most pressing challenge of present day, that of social justice, empathy, civic engagement, as well as in one sense, I would like to say it as the future, that of smart cities. So now coming to the uh, very theme of this panel discussion about empathy, about civic engagement, and the current context of, uh, let us say, the pandemic, uh, as well as the digital divide. Maybe I would like to begin to set the context of uh, what I feel is the mood of today. I would like to quote with uh, Charles Dickens. I would like to quote Charles Dickens and say, it is the best of times, it's also the worst of times. Whether you look at it from the point of view of the pandemic or from the point of view of just the technological advances that have happened. It is also the age of wisdom. It's also the age of foolishness. It's the epoch of belief. It's also the epoch of incredulity. So what I'm trying to say here in this context as setting the context here is, both the current times of the pandemic as well as the technology, I see a great ray of hope or maybe even a silver bullet to solve many of these issues of empathy and equity. And at the same time, I also see that there is despair because there is also divide, not just a digital divide, but also I would say the divide of the humanity. Because across the world, there is this huge gap, which is widening in terms of whether you think of, you know, intolerance towards others, etc. So in this particular time, I would say it's both best as well as worst of times, mainly because we also see that technology has the ability, has the potential to really be the bridge. There are so many examples which are given in this book as well, and also everywhere, that it is possible to build bridges. And similarly, the pandemic also has shown that it is possible to bridges or rather we could work as a global community to solve the problem of the pandemic, because it's only through global collaboration we would we definitely achieved the stage of whether it is the vaccination, whether it is the treatment for the uh, COVID-19, uh, etc. So let us now come to the very specific aspect which I would like to highlight here that uh, Mohammed Tahir in his uh, introduction as well as in the book talk about empathy. 
dictionaries define the word empathy as the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. That is, in other words, it's about being aware, being sensitive to others' feelings. Well, it is easy to you know, articulate this. It's easy to talk about it, but it is very, very difficult to implement, even if we have the best of interests. Because even though we can say that, you know, we will try our best to be in the shoes of others. It's not that simple. And that's why it's important to now for us to understand the difficulties and challenges of being truly empathetic, being truly inclusive, being truly equitable. So I would say that perhaps the lamps or professionals involved in the lamps should look at as our uh, speaker, the key speaker, uh, Madam Leslie Bayer said, that it is, we, are, we should be able to position lamps as the place that can offer those kinds of safe spaces. Those can be truly inclusive, or at least I would say, encourage empathy, encourage inclusiveness. With this very generic words, now I would like to I invite the panelists to share their views and their take on how, what are the actual steps that we can take in the context of LAMPS to build this empathy, to build equity or inclusiveness. Back, I would yes. like to invite uh, Laura Coleman. Laura, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Laura. I'm could you share your views on this uh, very important topic of empathy and equity and how libraries can actually solve some of these issues? Uh, thank you. I'm honored to be here and to um, be learning from all of you and with all of you on this uh, particular subject. Um, my uh, colleague, Abigail Phillips, and I have done um, a small amount of research across libraries, archives, and museums in uh, the United States concerning the topic of professional empathy. And um, I'm not sure what the steps are, to be quite honest. Um, and I would say that the uh, pandemic has definitely altered the format for how we move forward in it. What I am seeing, especially on the museum side, is that as we go back to museums, nothing has truly changed to make them more empathetic. Uh, museums were places that, of course, closed during the pandemic, and the vast majority of museum workers in the United States, um, upwards of 80% unemployment at the height of the pandemic. Um, Many people came back, if they came back, quite unhappy with the museum, unhappy to be there. And um, it has not done much to help with the area of being empathetic. Um, yeah, I'm not as sure about libraries. I believe libraries have managed to stay much more relevant to the population to stay open and to provide services where at least in the United States, the museums have failed to provide services to the general public uh, during this time. So um, may, I, may I pass this over to Abigail to ask her thoughts on the library side of it? Sure, may I invite now Abigail Phillips to continue the conversation? Hi, and thank you for, again, for inviting me. This is a great honor, and I, I'm also looking forward to learning from all of you. Um, libraries during COVID, they actually stayed open for quite, they were closed for a very short time. And so they've seen a lot more of COVID than I think a lot of institutions. They're open right now. Um, as far as empathy goes, I've, what I've heard from, I work a lot with library workers so librarians and library staff and clerical staff is a distinct lack of empathy from the public. Um, just anger and frustration of them closing it all, the hours, having to wear a mask. 
um, kind of um, anything that kind of gets in the way of them using the public library, which is understandable. Uh, libraries have always been open to the public, but in a crisis such as this, we want to put this health and safety of our library staff and library workers at the forefront. Um, so as, as far as empathy goes, I, it's, it's, I think these are um, curious times for empathy because I see a lot of empathy between uh, library workers, a lot of support, a lot of encouragement, a lot of um, we can get through this, those sort of mentalities. But um, just there's kind of that, that um, the, the two, they kind of contrast one another, what we're getting from the public versus what we're getting from one another. And I can pass it on to somebody else. No, now I have a question to both of you uh, because you shared your experiences and your thoughts during the pandemic as well as the uh, libraries and museums are concerned. Did you, could you use the technology because that's another part of this uh, theme of the uh, discussion. Do you think that the current technological space has uh, provided an opportunity to innovate and to be inclusive and to provide empathy during the pandemic as well as otherwise too? I, th I think so. Um, while libraries were closed, they were still doing a lot of, I, I speak mainly to libraries and yeah. not at quite as much to museums or archives, but they were doing reference questions. They were checking out books. They were doing quite a quite a bit of work with the public still, even though the doors were closed, the library was technically still open. Mm -hmm. The technology played a huge role in that. You have any specific data relating to whether, you know, through technology you were able to retain the same or reach out to the same uh, group of people that you were doing before? Um, I don't know if I have a good... I'm trying to think of a good example of, I'm just, I just think of my own personal usage of the library during the pandemic mm -hmm. and um, still wanting to be supportive of the library, even though they were closed and still wanting them to be, still part, wanting to feel part of a community. I don't know if Laura has, has an example or some yeah. more to say. Um, on the museum side, I would say that museums have uh, traditionally lagged behind libraries in terms of technology adoption, especially in the use of technologies that the general public have. Uh, it took museums a good 10 years to even acknowledge the existence of QR codes and other uh, things that everyday people were coming in contact with in, um, in other places. Uh, museums struggled to adapt their technology to produce um, the museum experience online to their, to their people. Um, a really good example of that would be here in Philadelphia. There is a museum that is a children's museum. It's geared for children, um, infants through about 12 years of age. And the museum is called the Please Touch Museum. You're supposed to touch everything in the museum. And of course, during the pandemic, they were not able to translate that experience online. And when they did create experiences that went out to the public, they were generally just tapping into their existing membership, which tended to be quite exclusive. And this is the, the sort of trend we see in, in museums. Okay, thank you. There is a question from Dr. Abdul Hamid Hatiani. Uh, you, I mean, the question, I'm just reading out the question. You talk of empathy from the public side. How about from the libraries to the public? Well, that's an excellent question. I think libraries have, since, since they are so tech friendly, they've taken, taken on a lot of um, finding ways to sh share empathy and show empathy. Uh, I think something as small, not as small, I shouldn't say that, 
But I think something that's always been, that's been really amazing to me is how libraries have translated in-house story times Mm -hmm. to make them virtual story times. And so children are still being exposed. They're getting literacy, building literacy skills. They're seeing other children and they're seeing, parents are seeing one another. I think, I think that's a, that's a demonstration of empathy for caring for one another and for wanting to continue the library work. Thank you. Uh, now, may I invite uh, Anita Coleman to share her views on this? Uh, I would now move from empathy to equity. What's your view on equity and particularly LAMPS as the space for equity? I want to first thank um, Dr. Tahir and say how honored I am to be here. And I, I am not sure if um, Tahir knows the connections. I suspect he does not. He was my first my boss supervisor at the American Studies Research Center um, in 1983. And so Dr. Urs, that dates all of us. <laughs> and <laughs> I am thrilled to be also with Dr. Urs because um, I went to the Ranganathan, the school that Ranganathan founded. That's where my MLIS is from, the Department of Library and Information Science, which is housed in the School of Na- Mathematics, Natural Sciences at um, the University of Madras, India. In Madras is now called Chennai. Uh, it's in South India. Um, and um, I learned programming there from the Indian Institute of Technology. And then when I did my PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, it was a quite a bit of a culture shock to um, my dean, who was very influential on me, had a great impact. Lee Esterbrook was the dean of social came from sociology. So libraries are social institutions with this mathematical and technological background. So I just want to acknowledge these different connections. I also want to follow um, Madam Leslie Weir's um, excellent um, 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 example and acknowledge with respect my presence on the ancestral lands of the Ioannino band of the Mission Indians, Akamanan Nation and the Tongva people. I'm based in Southern California, Irvine. And Irvine prides itself on being one of the smartest cities in the world. It's a great success story, one of the greatest success stories of the 20th century um, in planning. The city is celebrating its 50th anniversary and I have lived here 25 of those years. So I've lived more here in Irvine than anywhere else, including the place where I was born and brought up. And so I have a very, Um, unique perspective um, on um, um, equity. (laughs) So thank you for that question. Um, Can you see the second slide? I want to take as my focus from the book a couple of uh, different points that struck me. One was this inclusion, diversity, equity, and access lens. I really loved IDEA. There has been different versions of this, you know, Jedi is another one, Uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, Uh, ADI, and you know, you can go on. But I loved idea because ideas are very inspirational and ideas are what make us human. And the in the preface, uh, uh, Dr. Tahir mentions that um, LAMS are a potential partner in city planning and implementation. That's a very bold vision and statement and how many smart cities can claim this. Um, The other point I wanna speak to is this only 17.7% were familiar with OCLC, IMLS and Bechtel COVID-19 research partnership. And from these two points, I wanna talk a little bit about my career that has been outside of the traditional library archives museums. Um, Today, I claim the title of consultant, Powering Equity. Um, And I started this route because in 2015, we had the Charleston Library, uh, the Charleston shootings. And I was puzzled by the lack of understanding about anti-racism. Anti-racism is not just about race. It's about inclusion. And one of America's exports has been this racialization and racism to countries and cultures like India and China, which didn't have race. They have other hierarchies. 
and other ways of excluding people, but they didn't have race. And so I wanted to bring that idea back that anti-racism, which has its roots in anti-Semitism um, and it actually inclusion to put it in a positive way. And that means equity. You know, this whole idea of um, fairness to all people, recognizing the humanity, the basic humanity of everybody. And so I started the Anti-Racism Digital Library to educate people, mostly in faith-based communities, about anti-racism, its origins, and about including people. And today that library has taken off. It's, it's on, mentioned on LibGuides in a lot of different places. And I moved from that in 2018 when my city, the city I lived in, I've lived in for the most of my life, which has the highest number of immigrant population from all different parts of the world, revolted, literally rebelled and uh, against pla the placing of an emergency shelter in the city on um, some lands that we had. It was awful. And I wanted to educate people. So then I started the next one, which is the Housing Digital Library. It was called Irvine for Everyone. And this is class, class-based. And I want to talk in equity about values. Um, I also had the privilege of, for the last one and a half years of being a library director and hiring and training people and transforming a residential library to digital library services. That was not an easy task. And the, um, that was a, there were lots of challenges there. And one of the things we found was this ethic of care for each other, even within ourselves. You know, Abigail touched on it and Laura touched on it. Um, and in the book, um, Dr. Tahir's book, there is a fabulous section on information maintainers. And I think as professionals, we are maintainers, not just of collections, but also of human beings. And so what are the values that drive us? You know, when you talk equity, people get upset. They don't wanna talk about equity, but if you can talk about values, if you can talk about the structures of our origins, that our origins, I'm, for example, reading a book called, um, it's the book on library by Andrew Wedovin. And there is a part there that really bothers me because everything in that book is all about Western libraries and it's forgetting the Islamic libraries and the other kinds of libraries that have existed. And so looking at the structures of our origins, the ability to take the good things, but then also be bold and um, honest, authentic about the voices that are missing there. And I think the third thing I would say for equity is open source software. I love this um, webinar that Dr. Tahir has put together just for the broad global, it's bringing all these people from different places, the North and the South as we traditionally call it. And it's giving us this global perspective. We do live in a global world. And we live in a world where a lot of the people, there are more migrants now not just immigrants, but migrants, you know, moving has become such a big part of our lives and moving, I think humanity has always moved. But in this process, moving is expensive. We are getting into this whole software as a service, cloud comp computing and all these things. We need to be much more aware of open source software where we are funding people to develop the software and not the software licenses that have already been developed and that are now just, you know, somewhat predatory exploitative capitalism. So my slides, for example, are made with LibreOffice, open source, open office, not Microsoft Word. I'm not against Microsoft um, products. I'm just pointing out where, what are our values and how do we want to use technology? And in these projects, what I have done is community education. And what I've done is the used open source software like Omeka, which is not really open source, but sort of close because their licensing fees are very, very accessible um, and used them to build customized personal digital libraries that bring third spaces into the digital world. 
you know, over and over again, we hear that libraries are trusted spaces, museums are trusted spaces, archives are trusted spaces. And this professional empathy that we then bring to this takes professionalism with all its negative connotations, adds the empathy part to it, and the equity part then flows in when you pay attention to this. So it's not just a lifelong relationship with books or knowledge or information, but it's also then building that those connections with humanity, keeping this global perspective in mind. Um, I know I've put, put in a lot um, of ideas here, um, but I wanna just say um, equity then, when we look at it in terms of values, such as inclusion, belonging, um, we can reduce alienation. We can also go back to our smart cities and say, hey, you're collecting a lot of data, but the privacy practices, the surveillance practices, the storage practices for these are not as uh, transparent. Can, how can we help you as professionals with empathy and a concern for equity make these more transparent for you and show them that these kinds of digital libraries with trusted information um, can help. So for example, showing people that when they make these Google searches, predictive searches, the algorithms that drive them are sometimes, a lot of them are grounded in bias. And that's a lot of research. I mean, Sophia Noble is doing work on that. There's a lot of people in libraries, archives, museums, knowledge justice, um, is a huge term now. Um, so I think we can build these very um, customizable digital libraries very easily using open source software and in a, with a global perspective. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, thank you, Anita, for giving such an uh, elaborate uh, overview of the entire gamut of issues relating to equity, relating to race, and so many other things, as well as including how perhaps we could look at uh, I mean, beginning with open source software as one of the ways of, you know, uh, steps towards achieving openness and achieving equity and inclusion. Uh, the fact that you mentioned about racial and other issues brings me, I mean, at least uh, reminds me of the brilliantly written book uh, by Isabel Vickers and the cast, Origins of Our Discontents. Uh, I would recommend, you know, that's, uh, I mean, why I'm bringing that up is, I mean, one of the, I would say her sentences in the book that stuck with me is that she says like caste, because you know, in India we have this caste issue, if not exactly the racial issue, right? So, but she brings the similarity between caste and racial issue. So caste like grammar becomes the invisible guide, not only to how we speak, but how we process information the automatic calculations that figure into a sentence without ever having to think about it. Why I bring this particular quote, or why I quote this is because as I said in the very beginning, it's not about our intent or our articulation of saying that, you know, all of us want, I mean, even those who want to be equitable, sometimes there are these hidden things which we are unaware of. That's why I said the challenge is to first understand, you know, of course the, biases or the inequities, social justice, etc. But beyond and behind this is also the unconscious biases, which we don't, we are not even aware of, even if we try to be. So that's a huge challenge. And then that's why I said the lambs perhaps could start this as a first step towards bringing that kind of an awareness. I mean, this book is something, you know, uh, when I read this book, uh, cast it, kind of opened up, you know, I went through my own experiences in the last uh, 50 years. Then I realized, you know, many a times there have probably been many instances of my own lack of understanding or lack of empathy for someone. You know, the othering becomes so much, I would call it as, uh, you know, unconscious othering that happens many a times. So it's a huge challenge. And perhaps we could make a beginning with uh, lamps and with, uh, you know, softwares and everything else also. Uh, and probably uh, that's why I even said this is the best of times, you know, when you, everyone is suffering from the same con uh, pandemic, everyone realizes we are all same human beings. Whether you're rich or poor, that's what we were talking about that in India. It doesn't matter. 
COVID doesn't distinguish between a rich person or a poor person. So, I, but that realization actually has to be, has to happen. Anyway, thank you so much. So I will now uh, invite our uh, next uh, panelist. Can I call upon uh, Sarangi, please? Utangi, are you there? She had to leave. Oh, she's not there. Yeah. So then do we have the other uh, speaker, Vanessa Arvin? Yes. Hi, Vanessa, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, please share your um, views. I know that we are we're running over time, so I'm not going to um, uh, stay, say too much, but I'm very happy to be here, very privileged and honored uh, to be invited. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am here as a learner today um, to learn from all of you because I've, as a, many of you I've never met before and never been exposed to before. So I've been um, really enjoying uh, what everyone, all the knowledge and the wisdom that has been shared uh, in this meeting today and, and becoming acquainted with all of your work and your um, interests. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, in previewing the book, um, I was able to preview some parts of it. And um, what I'm, I'm grateful for this book, because I feel as though it does start to address some questions and some ideas that need to be had, such as uh, what is uh, aimed for the public and what is not looking at libraries, archives, and museums as these intersectional spaces with one another that we are, you know, um, intrinsically connected and related to one another. And that this book um, is like challenging us to really dive into those relationships and build on those relationships in meaningful ways. With the pandemic and the context of being, you know, in COVID, I feel that that has given all of us an opportunity to really um, explore uh, these questions and these ideas in terms of our commonalities for public engagement. And also too, as I was reading some parts of the book, a question that came to me was, what is the difference between community engagement and civic engagement? Because those terms, right, are used um, a lot and in various ways. And so I'm, I, I'm wondering, um, we, you know, we need to be specific about what we mean when we say civic and what we mean when we say community, right? So I really um, appreciate um, that idea. Also, um, I just wanna share that um, I've been working in LIS academia uh, for the past uh, 15, 20 years and I'm a public librarian by trade and practice. And so I've always, my research has always been connected with public librarianship, public librarians. So I really appreciated Dr. Erz, you mentioned earlier about um, us as library professionals and practitioners looking at our biases and our um, approaches to our work and to libraries and what do we think about libraries and what do we think they are based on the lenses that we are coming with. And I wanna add on that quickly to say that as a library information science educator, this is the exact issue that we have to approach with students who come into our programs that I often have to tell students when they come into library information science programs that often conclude studying of archives that the biases that they have about libraries, right? Libraries automatically being quiet, libraries automatically being fully accessible, librarians automatically just being um, all knowledge and all knowing. And that within those biases, people are coming in with their own cultural and social unconscious stuff and it gets to be really complex, um, you know, uh, sharing knowledge in the name of education, of um, unpacking and um, dissolving some of those ideas. So I said that to say that I agree that we have a lot of work to do and that I feel like the pandemic has forced us to, to really begin to look at these um, um, earnest and complicated issues uh, fully. So um, I have more, but I know that we're, again, I know we're like running over. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for trying to distinguish, I mean, help us actually focus on the differences between, uh, say, civic engagement and community engagement, because these nuances are important, especially, I would say.
Okay, if there are no questions, uh, are there any questions from one panelist to the another? There was Thank a question early on about social injustice. Um, you know, somebody had asked that, you know, to for um, Tahirji to um, elaborate on the social injustice in okay. uh, his archives museums um, that he had on one of his slides. From my slides? Yes. Yes, so the, the bottom line is uh, there is good, good capacity to accommodate people, good working relationship with people, with staff, with the collections. Social justice is broadly, I would say yes. But then the 80-20 question comes up. 80% of the time it looks that it is all comfortable, it's all good, 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 good days. But then 20% of that would be sometimes there are blind spots. These blind spots are human nature. These blind spots have been, have been unconsciously been present there. For example, if I'm an immigrant to a land where I, had, I don't have a local experience, the country tells me, the librarians tell me, the professionals tell me that I must have local experience. I go volunteer for 15 different places and 15 different hours, and I come back and say, they say, oh, you don't have a local degree that is equivalent to the job. Then I go get an AL accreditation certificate from American Library Association. They say, oh, you are still a foreigner. You are not a local immigrant, local native. So you cannot be equivalent to what I thought would be trained in my school and my environment. So this is the 20% of the issues that are not the major ones, but 20%, I would say bluntly to say that there is a reality that there is gap in social justice. There's one part of the picture. The other part of the picture is the civic engagement. When I think of civic engagement, I mentioned Ranganathan's third law of library science as extension service. This extension service has been termed as outreach. Outreach has been termed as publicity, advertising, reaching the public to bring them back to the libraries. In fact, Ranganathan mentioned that we, these are the last people who have to be brought back. But I go further beyond that of those 60% who are not being served. 40% are being served, they come back, they may be brought back, they may be receiving information about libraries. What about me, the 60% who are not engaged, who are not involved, who are not being outreached? Ranganathans would take the books to their door shelf. I dedicated my postdoctoral thesis to Ranganathan and his team at the University of Madras in 1931, where he created a band of a team of people. Where did he get this knowledge from? He went to London to see the queen, no, sorry, not to see the queen, but to see Berwick Sayers, his master and his tutor and his companion. Berwick Sayers would show him the land, would show him the libraries. He brought the, he brought the idea to India, of the public libraries being open and free for all. That is the first law of library science. He, he formulated that same time in 25, he trained in 31, he had his five laws and they were in the picture telling me what to do after 100 years. Now this is almost 2031. I cannot forget those five laws because those are the foundational principles that I need to be alerted, that I need to be continuously being telling people that information is not a showpiece. It's not a touch me not, it's a touchable. British Library created a touchable screen in about 20 to 15 years back. British Library was probably the leading one which had a touch screen to finally read a book. Thank you. Thank you, Tahir. Uh, are there any other questions? Otherwise, I think we are running out of time. I would like to thank all my panelists, as well as, of course, uh, Mohammed Tahir, as well as our main speaker, Leslie Wei, for all the wonderful uh, learning that I got from each one of you. Uh, any other questions? Anyone, any closing thoughts? Would you like to have a closing thought, each one of your panelists? Yes, I think um, I was very, um, one of the things that has struck me very much is this very ambitious project, as you said, of bringing lots of different ideas and people together from across the globe. Um, and to be very practical, one of the things that Leslie Weir said, we need to change our institutions from within, greater diversity in our profession. And I think Tahir uh, G has also highlighted 
inclusion, belonging, when immigrants come, um, don't make them feel all the time that they are the other. Um, you know, one of my favorite, I have a poem actually about this. I am always the other. You know, I go to India, I am an other because I'm no longer Indian. I, in America, I am an other because I wasn't born in this country, so on and so forth. In libraries, I have too much technology. On the other hand, they want my technology <laughs> skills. So I think instead of um, separating by categorizing, you know, my tagline at one point in my research life used to be people categorize, I ask why. And so I would say, can we ask why? And can we find ways to bridge these differences? And can we continue our own lifelong learning? Always, always understanding that we have biases, we see perspective, have our lived experiences and can we just be open to constant change ourselves? Because that's what the world and our profession today demands and needs more than anything else. So thank you for giving me this um, lovely opportunity. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Laura, Laura Coleman, do you want to close with any closing comments? Me? Uh, you mean? Laura, Laura. Laura, sorry. Laura, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Um, I just want to say thank you. This has been very wonderful. I actually have to run and meet a student now, but um, I really enjoyed and hearing all of these different voices and sharing. Um, I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, is Abigail there? Or has she left? Yes, I'm no, here. She's there. Okay, sorry. Thank you so much. Yeah. What about Vanessa? I know you were the last one to speak, but you could also have used this opportunity to have a, your closing comments. Um, hi, no, I don't have much more to add. I really uh, resonate with a lot that, well, pretty much with what everyone had to say. I just find it wonderfully refreshing to be in one room with a group of people who share, <laughs> you know, similar ideas and values and for uh, a profession that clearly we are all passionate about. So I'm very excited to um, have met all of you and hoping that we can stay connected. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anissa. I think we could close this uh, panel discussion saying that together we can bring in that empathy and inclusive. So let us start with libraries, museums, and archives as the places for empathy and equity. Perhaps we could make, a, I mean, the beginning has been made, but we could strengthen that, okay? With that, I'll just uh, end my closing uh, remarks on this uh, panel. Over to you, back to you, uh, Tahir. Thanks a lot, Professor Shalini. And Anita, sorry, I've, I have now the old memories of 1983 when you were my colleague at the American Studies Research Center. It, it took me so long to remember Anita, who's this? Anita, yes, I know that Anita. <laughs> the last name was just been out of my mind for some time. Anyways, I got it now. <laughs> and I thank all the panelists for agreeing in this short time to be present, to be, to be sharing their insights and to be the kind of light for the audience, the light that is needed all the time, every time when we forget that light is for everyone, but light that light doesn't make me literate. That light is available for me, but that doesn't make me motivated. So that light which you brought as panelists is essential and important. And I thank you, Madam Leslie Ware, for being with us, for blessing this, this occasion and for conveying the national, international message to the audience. I see here people from India, people from Indonesia, people from UK and people from Canada, people from America and people I don't have the long list, but they are all here. And my thanks to everyone. My thanks to all the people who have been awake now, a half, half past night for some places. And some places they are already late by the daytime, whatever time is there. And I thank everyone for this honorable presence in this uh, event of the release of the book and the webinar. And please keep the book in mind that we need to spread the word. My idea is not to sell the book. Please, I'm not a publisher. I'm not a make money making machine. My idea is to disseminate information. That is what is my whole 
contention is. In fact, I wanted to bring a message from a, another librarian who is the librarian of the Alexandria Library. He has a very good, compassionate message for the communities. I didn't get his permission to share it. The moment I get permission, I'll get it to circulate it to everyone. He has a, a tremendous compassionate message for justice, for engagement, for saying, he says he lives for the humanity as a human being. And he's the director of the Alexandria Library in Egypt, who is reviving that old Alexandrian library. So this is empathy. I should thank you, first of all, understand you, first of all, and accommodate you, first of all, understanding. That is empathy. And equity for me is not just fairness. Equity for me is thinking of you as me, as human being, as a people who are living and people who have their own needs. But I need to understand that I'm late, that I delayed my session because of my shortcomings in technology. I apologize for that. It's I delayed Prof, Prof, Madam, Madam Leslie Ware's session as well. I took her time and I'm sorry about that. So with this sorries and thank yous and blessings and acknowledgement, I say, please stay connected. Let's spread the word everywhere, anyhow, anywhere. Thank you. suitable for use in your course syllabus and as an integral resource for research advancements within your department, this publication should be included within your institution's library along with these related publications. Offered in print, ebook, and print plus ebook, and as a part of IJ Global's ebook collection, this publication is available through IJ Global's online bookstore as well as many other major booksellers and platforms, including EBSCOhost, Gobi, ProQuest, and Oasis. Purchase or recommend this title to your library today.